Welcome to Zoom Me In Coronavirus Special. I'm Simone Gao. Today, my guest is Dr. Eric Feigl Ding. He's a public health scientist who is currently a visiting scientist in the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also the chief health economist for Michael Clinic International. Thank you, Dr. Ding, for being with us today. So, can you first tell us where the U.S. is at the curve right now? The U.S. right now is still at a very, very dangerous part of the curve. The U.S., as you know, is is a big country and has many different pockets. You,、uh, China, you know, for example, who was mostly just concentrated in Wuhan, but New York right now is the epicenter. But U.S. has multiple epicenters. I think epicenters、uh, like New York. There's some signs that the hospitalization has starting to decline. But the deaths still have not, and in many other parts of the country, like Louisiana and Michigan,、um, they they are just still very much emerging and could get very much worse in the near future. So the U.S. is definitely definitely not out of the woods. I would say that most of the country is still an emerging epidemic、uh, situation. Yeah, so we are weeks or even months away from apex as a nation. Um, I would like to talk first about it's more like a plateau as a whole country, but remember the the U.S. is as big as many different、uh, European countries combined, and as you know, different countries have different trajectories. Italy has has peaked, but many other country has not. So in the U.S., I think we might plateau in late May or June. But this is very much、uh, complicated. By there could be more hotspots in other parts of the U.S. I would say there's still a very high chance that it would continue to grow and exponentially grow. Exponential growth, and you said we won't plateau till May or June. Late May or June, as a country,、um, but there, like, there will be places in which it will plateau. Like right now, Washington State has、uh, had only a very slow, steady number of growth. In certain ways, that's the best we can hope for in the near future. I think a sub-exponential growth to just a few linear handful of cases would actually be a good change.、Um, but again, many different parts of the country have many different emerging infections. Think of the U.S. as a big ship. Uh, we have very porous borders, as you know, between states. And if you have thirty states that are、um, have have good lockdowns, but the other states do not, your ship is still sinking because you haven't plugged all the holes in your sinking ship. So this is why it's really hard to predict because the U.S. is truly a an interwoven country with many many states that are. Uh, different stages of the epidemic. So you support a very draconian measure. For example, the whole country needs to be shut down before we plateau. I think we need to have a nationwide shutdown,、um, a very good, well enforced one. Because some states, they're they have a lockdown, quote unquote, but their lockdown is in name only. The the, the lockdown rule is half a page, but the number of exemptions is t- t-、uh, one and a half to two pages long. Right now, it, the lockdown on a state-by-state level is just too incomplete to have a good containment control. What about those asymptomatic people? What do they add to the whole picture from the epidemiology point of view? Yeah, the asymptomatic cases is really tricky. There's two kinds of asymptomatics. There are completely asymptomatic, and they will never develop symptoms. And then there are pre-symptomatic, as in they're still in their incubation time. From the infection period to when they will de- develop symptoms in the future, this pool is anywhere from 25 percent to 50 percent. The Deborah Burks, you know, she said it's up to 25 percent, but in in Iceland, which Iceland is the capital of all testing, they are the king.、Um, they've they do more tests than 10 times what the U.S. does. And what the,、uh, on per capita basis, and what they found is like there was one study in Iceland that shows 50 percent of their cases are asymptomatic when whenever they use that kind of nationwide testing. 
And that's worrisome. That's really worrisome that they found so many cases with no symptoms because it means even if you do have a good testing uh, of people who have symptoms, you're still missing a lot of people. And, and, and I think th these people will continue to keep the epidemic going even when we supposedly think, oh, there's no more people coming to hospitals. But that means that there will be more virus sh circulating the community looking for susceptible people, but silently without anyone knowing it. And that is a real insidious reality that we might have with this epidemic. In that scenario, would the draconian measure help? I mean, if we just separate people with social distancing, so the virus doesn't have a host, doesn't matter if you have symptoms or not, if the virus doesn't get to travel from host to host, wouldn't that make them die out within the period of time? Yeah, and so the social distancing measures definitely do help against these asymptomatic cases because by distancing yourselves from anyone, regardless of symptoms, regardless of symptoms, um, you can potentially um, buy time for the virus to be defeated uh, by, uh, by individuals in isolation before they have the chance to spread to someone else. And so I think that's the, that's the we're, we're buying time for, remember, uh, to also for the, vir the epidemic to die down so that when someone is home, they can defeat the virus by themselves eventually and allow them that when it, whenever the epidemic, uh, whenever we reopen society, that most of us will have defeated it and therefore the number of active transmissions will be lower, whether uh, asymptomatic or non-asymptomatic. Can a virus stay in a human body for a long time? Obviously, after the incubation time, which is uh, on average seven days or less, uh, what happens is that, you know, there is about a median phase of the illness, um, almost three weeks. But there are people who sh keep shedding viruses from the body for up to 37 days after you first develop symptoms. And this is what's really tricky, that this illness is a very, very long illness. Um, and this is what allows many of the containment uh, measures to unable to fully contain it. Uh, according to South Korea's CDC, the virus could be reactivated in patients who have recovered. So can you tell us about that? For example, what percentage of the people are demonstrating that? Yeah, we don't know what percentage, but um, for example, South Korea found previously infected people who were supposedly cured of it and um, were fully recovered have now developed the, uh, the virus again. Um, an infection again. What happened likely is not that they were reinfected, but that the virus was never fully eliminated from their body. It probably existed at an extremely low level, undetectable level, and they basically fought it off and suppressed it at that time. And then uh, they recovered in symptoms and, and their tests were negative. But in actuality, the virus is still living in parts of their body hidden. And later on, they reactivate and, and then um, re-increase in their numbers again for some reason that we don't know why. And this reactivation is kind of tricky. This is not like completely un, uh, unheard of. Tuberculosis actually is like this. Half the world has been exposed to tuberculosis. What happens is if you win against tuberculosis, the, the TB bacteria become sequestered inside certain nodules in your lung for the rest of your life. So for the rest of your life, you technically still will carry TB, but they're sequestered away and locked away in a place that can no longer infect you. In this case, we don't know yet how that happens. But this is not an unheard of phenomenon, but it just makes containment of this virus even more difficult. Hope that helps. Hmm. 
if we combine the two factors, uh, you know, the virus could be reactivated and also the existence of the asymptomatic people. Does that mean after a curve is flattened, the virus could very likely come back again? Well, first of all, e even regardless of reactivation, um, even after the, fl flat, uh, the curve is flattened, there's still a high chance that we will have a resurgence. Whether it's from re-importation from somewhere else, like China has a, a, a importation problem of cases that it keeps having from foreigners or returning on uh, Chinese nationals who return back to China and then test the positive because they carry it from another country. That will always exist as a risk because we are a global society right now and people from all over the world will continue to keep traveling. And the epidemic is expected to grow in the summer months, um, in the winter months in the Southern Hemisphere. So between that and the fact that this epidemic, we don't know if we are able to fully capture all the asymptomatic people, this epidemic will likely be with us until we have a vaccine. So the issue is we will have to likely play a, a cat and mouse, a break and a no break in terms of our society, uh, in terms of distancing and mitigation measures with this virus for the probably the rest of the year. So we'll probably go through some slow down cycles, but likely we will see resurgence cycles as well. You know, China now is opening up the country, it asks everybody to go back to work. So what's your assessment of the possibility of a second outbreak in China? I think uh, the chance of a resurgence is very high because, you know, China keeps um, still detecting a lot of asymptomatic cases. As of April 1st, they're finally, finally reporting the number of lab positive asymptomatics. Previously, in China, if you were lab positive test, but no symptoms, they did not report you as a case in the confirmed tally. Uh, but we always knew that they were there. Um, but now they're finally declaring it. And clearly, there are uh, many, many dozens and dozens, if not over 100 um, asymptomatic cases in China um, in, in any given week. And that's the nature of asymptomatic cases. The fact that we find them is we're very lucky to, but the fact that we find them means that there's a lot more out there as well. And this will always be a existential, existential risk. And will we truly be safe in reopening the country? Because we know there is an epidemic always potentially lurking around the corner if we're not careful. And they reopened uh, some of the national parks recently and all of a sudden, a flood of people all congregated in the uh, like the Huangshan um, parks, uh, and and it's and it's always is this risk that it could come back. Dr. Deborah Burks said at the White House press briefing that when you look at the Chinese data originally with 50,000 people infected in an area of China with 80 million people, uh, you start thinking of this more like a SARS than you do a global pandemic. Uh, the medical community interpreted the Chinese data as uh, this was serious, but smaller than anyone expected but probably we're missing a significant amount of data. So could you, tell, could you tell me what we would have done differently if we knew the true picture of the pandemic, if China revealed all the information early on? Yeah, in terms of the epidemic, I think China obviously made a few missteps in trying to silence Dr. Li Wenliang and um, the slow reaction at the end of December whenever they should have moved quickly at the end of December to stop the epidemic. And by Jan early, the first half of January, the epidemic was already booming in many parts of um, Wuhan and other parts of China. So we knew by late December, early January, that there was definitely an epidemic, but the world did not know the full scope. So had we known that, maybe other countries could have taken measures sooner if they knew it was so serious. And the degree of severity was always a mystery. 
was this just a bad pneumonia or was this uh, seriously a very dangerous virus that was much more dangerous than a regular pneumonia? Uh, that said, Korea, South Korea had this, um, their first case as the United States on the same day, I think January 15 or 16. But look at South Korea now. They put in very, very aggressive testing. U.S. did not. Their aggressive testing has basically finally flattened the curve. And actually, not just flattened the curve. South Korea has crushed the curve. Because in Daegu, the epicenter where the megachurch, South Korean megachurch was, for the first time uh, in, in a long time, Daegu has zero cases yesterday. Zero new cases, despite very detailed testing. So that's a sign. Uh, that even in the hottest epicenter, uh, South Korea has fought it off. And South Korea had their first case at the same time as the United States. But look at the United States right now. We've clearly, clearly not aggressively acted enough, whether from testing perspective or mitigation and con contact tracing containment perspective. We did not do all those things. Well, South Korea did aggressive, aggressive early testing even before the mega church epidemic, we had uh, South Korea had very aggressive testing and very aggressive contact tracing. They have, actually have an app that systematically contact traces very quickly. We had neither of these here in the United States. Yeah, I don't know if South Korea and places like Taiwan had a different opinion on whether the Chinese data was trustworthy. I mean, after all, before Italy's outbreak, uh, even when America and South Korea had their first cases, China is all we know. China is the only reference we got. So if we trusted China's numbers, we would got this false sense of security, which we did. So do you think if we didn't trust their numbers or if they didn't cover up, we, we would have taken more draconian measures such as shutting down the entire country very early? In certain ways, you know, if we know everything, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? We, we would always have the perfect answer for everything if we knew what would happen under certain scenarios. The part of life and governance uh, is making these predictions and making these calls uh, as they go with incomplete information and lack of clarity of, of the future. And so, yes, knowing what we know now, obviously we should have um, clamped down earlier. At the same time, I was one of the whistleblowers early in uh, mid-January because I saw that this was a danger. And, um, but obviously, you know, people didn't, governments didn't heed my warnings. And, but look, again, look at South Korea. They did blanket testing very early. Uh, look at Iceland, blanket testing very early. And even there was a, a case in the Faroe Islands in, um, uh, in north of Norway, it's a part of Denmark. In Faroe Islands, they had a hundred some cases on this island. And one uh, scientist did aggressive testing of 10% of the entire population. And now the epidemic is nowhere to be seen uh, in the daily batches of tests. Their schools are open. Their children are playing sports. Um, and so, but at that moment, they did not have complete information like we do now, but they moved in favor of of crisis management this is where good governance makes a huge huge difference and if we had the governance and scientific leadership like some of these countries did and listening to science the scientists that we need to test aggressively develop uh, laboratory tests very quickly um, and aggressively contact trace every single positive test and to quarantine them we could have defeated it as well. How is the U.S. doing with testing right now? Yeah, we're doing much more testing. The U.S. has currently done more tests than any other country, but you know that's that's on a per capita basis. We're still not the leaders. 
our per capita bases were still in the middle of the pack compared to some countries. We're doing, definitely doing better than India and Bangladesh and Indonesia testing for, for sure. But we're not nearly uh, as aggressive as South Korea or Iceland. And so um, our testing, you know, in some, in some ways we have millions of tests done, but at the same time, um, we had promised that we would have double digit number of millions of, te of tests done, but we have not. What we need with the kind of testing we we're doing now is more like oftentimes once people have shortness of breath and they can't afford to stay home anymore and then they go get testing or whenever they go to hospital, they get testing. That is not the testing you need. Not all testing is alike. Testing identifies cases, but to truly, truly stop an epidemic, you need early testing, what I call frontier testing, of new cases as soon as they develop a fever, as soon as they develop a cough, test them, contact trace them, isolate them. Because again, America is very, has very loose um, uh, lockdowns, and uh, many states don't have lockdowns whatsoever. So by having aggressive early testing of someone who just developed symptoms, that can actually stop the epidemic way faster than if you test just when someone has uh, shortness of breath or going to a hospital. Thank you, Dr. Ding. That's it for today's coronavirus special. You are watching Zooming In with Simone Gao. Please download our podcast from Spotify, iTunes, and Google Play. Stay tuned. Goodbye.